five facts about scoliosis causes. Scoliosis is the development of a sideways spinal curvature. And this is an unnatural spinal curvature from the front of the spine that also rotates, making it a complex three-dimensional condition. Scoliosis is also progressive, meaning it is very nature to worsen over time. And we also know scoliosis ranges right widely in severity from mild to moderate to severe to very severe. Less than 20% of scoliosis cases have known causes, meaning 20% uh, of di uh, diagnosed cases are associated with something that we can actually say could be potentially causing the scoliosis. And this is something called neuromuscular scoliosis, degenerative scoliosis, and congenital scoliosis. Neuromuscular scoliosis is caused by the presence of a larger neuromuscular condition like muscular dystrophy, cerebral palsy, Marfan syndrome, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, spina bifida, and these are normally conditions that affect the connective tissue of the body, meaning the muscles or the ligaments, or something that affecting the nerve system of the body, like the spinal cord or spinal nerves or brain. Degenerative scoliosis is caused by the degeneration of the spine that's accelerated in a certain area, typically the lumbar spine, and this area has degenerated faster than the rest of the spine, causing the discs and the bones to become asymmetrical, which can lead to a scoliosis developing in that area. And the last type is congenital scoliosis, and this is caused by a malformed bone that occurs in development in utero, so the patient is actually born with scoliosis. Now, the other 80% are normally diagnosed with something called idiopathic scoliosis. Idiopathic scoliosis means there's, there's no clearly associated single cause. Idiopathic scoliosis is the most, com most common type of scoliosis in both children and adults. And we, the most common type of scoliosis is actually something called adolescent idiopathic scoliosis because the most common time of diagnosis of scoliosis is during adolescent growth phases. However, the most largest population of patients with scoliosis is later stage life because we have all the adolescent cases that were not diagnosed that get diagnosed later on in life because of pain or discomfort. Now, we know scoliosis is not a genetic condition. Um, there is um, no, no single gene or a genetic mutation that accounts for the development of scoliosis hasn't been identified yet. And we know scoliosis incidence does increase more in families, but this doesn't necessarily mean it's genetically caused. It just means it's, it has a familiar tendency as opposed to genetic. Um, they've done studies on identical twins and they've only found about 60% of identical twins to both share scoliosis. The other 40% don't. So therefore, there's other factors and these are patients that have the exact same DNA. So these factors are unknown. We also know idiopathic it tends to be a multifactorial problem. So meaning some patients can have more than one factor that's contributing to the development of their scoliosis. And these factors could be something like lifestyle, body type, responses to stress, diet, geographic location, social, economic factors, and so forth. And multi-factor means that there, these, these variables can also change from person to person. So what causes scoliosis in one person may not be the same thing as what causes scoliosis in another person. Knowing the cause of idiopathic scoliosis typically doesn't change the course of treatment or its outcome. You know, typically I remind patients that idiopathic scoliosis, although we don't fully understand its onset, we know exactly how to treat the condition effectively. Knowing the cause wouldn't necessarily change our treatment outcome because by the time we find scoliosis, scoliosis has become structural, meaning that whatever caused it may be completely gone but now the curve itself is become a structural component within the body, so you much tr must treat the, st the structural issue. And the best way I like to explain this is, let's say, for whatever reason, the scoliosis developed because of a nutritional deficiency. And let's just say, for whatever reason, we say it's vitamin D. We say vitamin, vitamin D is the reason why, a lack of vitamin D is the reason why this person developed scoliosis. Well, now the person has a 25, 30, 40 degree curve. We diagnose it. We can replace vitamin D all we want now. The curve now has become structural. The vitamin D is not going to go away. Or let's say the person has, you know, scoliosis now because of a lack of neurotransmitters. Well, we can give all the neurotransmitters in the world. The curve isn't going to go away now because the curve has become structural, meaning it's become, the person grew with it and developed with it. You must deal with the scoliosis on a structural level. So therefore, even though we can't tell you the cause, doesn't necessarily mean we can't treat it effectively. And since we know scoliosis is a progressive condition, the best time to treat scoliosis is always as close to the time of diagnosis because we know where scoliosis is diagnosed is nowhere indicative of where it's gonna stay.
So here at Scoliosis Reduction Center, we definitely treat scoliosis in a proactive manner in preventing progression and the need for future invasive surgical treatment. Regardless of the cause and the reason why scoliosis developed, the best approach to treating scoliosis is really a proactive approach. So it's how you respond to your scoliosis gonna be the biggest indicator on what happens over, over the length of your life and what choices you make in terms of how the scoliosis is treated. Thanks for watching. I hope you found this information helpful. If you'd like to hear about other topics and information on scoliosis, type in the comments below and let us know. And finally, subscribe and hit the bell icon to be notified of when we publish content. Thanks.